Hi there, Mr. Upside here, back with more information for you to comprehend. Today we're going back in time to take a look at the vast subject of the Progressive Era. In the Industrial Era, we created a lot of problems for ourselves, such as poor working conditions, child labor, and slums. But the Progressive Era is kind of when we tried to clean all of that up, for the most part. The word progressive is defined as happening or developing gradually or in stages, proceeding step by step. The progressive era is defined as a period of social activism and political reform in the United States that flourished from the 1890s to the 1920s. Now, let's jump into a world of corruption, important amendments, and most importantly, political machines. What's that? Political machines are often dishonest and prefer to keep themselves in power rather than provide good government? <laughs> of course they did. They were political. Let's learn the Progressive Era. Wait, wait, wait. Say that again. The Progressive Era? Well, I'll be. After three episodes, you finally Boss. said it right. You finally Boss. managed to say the w what? What? The people are waiting. Oh, right. Yes, of course. Uh, please, carry on. S say it again for their benefit. They've probably already forgotten what this is we're supposed to be talking about. You got it, boss. <clears throat> Let's learn the electromagnetic spectrum. Oh, for Pete's sake. Looking back on it today, the Progressive Era really wasn't that terribly progressive, seeing that the word progressive implies progress, which, in turn, looking at the era, we can see that the era was home to one of the biggest anti-freedom acts of history, prohibition. So maybe we shouldn't call it a progressive era, maybe we should call it a cleaning up era, or sweeping everything under the rug era. Just a thought. After Upton Sinclair published the book entitled The Jungle, the nation went into an outright frenzy, mostly because it was a jungle, as illustrated in the book. Anyhow, the progress and prosperity image the nation held was quickly and completely shattered. Sinclair and others like him would become the primary individuals in an era of reform movements that overtook the nation at the beginning of the 20th century. Even though we categorize progressives into one single group, the people who were in it did not necessarily share the same opinions. However, the group's goals did fall into four simple categories. Moral, economic, social, and political. Progressives included Democrats and Republicans alike, as well as some additional members from other political parties. Even so, the reformers mostly consisted of people with at least four common beliefs. Government should be more accountable to its citizens. Government should curb the power and influence of wealthy interests. Government should be given expanded power so that it could become more active in improving the lives of its citizens. Government should become more efficient and less corrupt so that it could competently handle an expanded role. There were three main reform organizations. 1. The Labor Movement In the 1890s, slowly but surely, the union movement began to grow. With it, employers downcast union membership, preferring to deal with one worker at a time. If unions did slip through, business leaders could repeatedly rely on courts to issue injunctions. These are court orders that prohibit a certain activity. In this case, it was to prevent workers from going on strike. Even so, the workers continued to fight for better working conditions through United rather than individual bargaining. 2. Socialists During the Progressive Era, there was a definite rise in socialism, an economic and political philosophy favoring public or governmental control of property and income. Many American socialists wanted to end the capitalist system, distribute wealth more equally, and let the government own American industries. Surprisingly enough, most socialists wished to achieve these goals through the ballot box, not through a revolution. Writers Edward Bellamy and Upton Sinclair, among others, promoted socialist ideas. 3. Women's Groups Women's organizations played an essential role in nearly every major reform issue of the time period. One leading women's group was the National Consumers League, made to investigate the conditions that goods were made and sold. Despite the progressives' efforts, the very people they were trying to help opposed them in some cases. This resulted in a thought that progressives were unjust to the poor. There were different reforms that took place at different levels of power. These levels were the municipal or city level, the state level, and the federal level. Municipal reforms were where many of the earliest progressive reforms took place. These reformers opposed the influence of political bosses. At this level, reformers made efforts to control or destroy the monopolies that gave the city water, gas, and electricity in hopes to run them on their own. Some reform mayors led actions for city-funded welfare services. Some believed that with good social conditions, all people would become good citizens. 
Of course this was impossible, and to us it sounds as far-fetched as a cat successfully piloting a spaceship to the moon with catnip on board. A few governors and state legislators were in favor of progressive reforms. Like reformers at the municipal level, progressives strived to give power back to the citizens. During the Progressive Era, voters were able to gain more power making decisions in lawmaking and choosing candidates. There were four reforms and one amendment to help achieve this. Direct primary, where voters select their party's candidates. The 17th Amendment, allowing citizens to select U.S. Senators by popular vote. Initiative, allowing voters to put bills before legislature and let them argue about them. Referendum, letting voters vote directly on bills. And recall, permitting voters to remove elected officials from office. After Theodore Roosevelt became president in 1901, federal reforms began to take flight in the White House. Roosevelt described the presidency as a bully pulpit, creating the perfect atmosphere to support moral, worthy causes. TR's Square Deal was put into action after the United Mine Workers called a strike to protest their low wages in May of 1902. The Sherman Antitrust Act from 1890 was in place to try and prohibit and discourage monopolies, however it had never been enforced as well as it should have been. Roosevelt's Attorney General recognized this and proceeded to sue the Northern Securities Company. The Supreme Court later dissolved this corporation. <coughs> After regulating the railroads and protecting the public's health as well as the environment, Roosevelt proceeded to blow our minds and create the 16th, 17th, and 18th Amendment. Ratified in 1913, the 16th Amendment allowed Congress to collect federal income taxes. Also ratified in 1913, the 17th Amendment required the direct election of senators. Finally, the 18th Amendment was ratified in 1919, banning the production, sale, or import of alcoholic beverages. The 18th Amendment was repealed in 1933 by the ratification of the 21st Amendment, the only time the U.S. has repealed an amendment. In 1908, William Howard Taft easily became president with support from Roosevelt against Democrat William Jennings Bryan. He immediately found his forerunner's shoes hard to fill. After Taft failed miserably to properly manage public lands and pass beneficial tariff reductions, Roosevelt campaigned for progressive candidates during the 1910 midterm elections. In distaste for Taft, the progressive Republicans simply walked out and created their own party, later nicknamed the Bull Moose Party. The Bull Moose platform included tariff reduction, women's suffrage, more regulation of business, a child labor ban, an eight-hour workday, a federal workers' compensation system, and the direct election of senators. When the election of 1912 came around, Taft, Roosevelt, Wilson, and labor leader Eugene V. Debs all ran for presidency. The Republican vote was split between Taft and Roosevelt, but ultimately Wilson came out on top. He earned only 42% of the popular vote, but in the electoral vote he won by miles, 435 votes to TR's 88 and to Taft's measly 8. When Woodrow Wilson took office, we began to see the light of our better days. His first major victory was tariff reduction, followed closely with a federal income tax to make up the loss of government revenue. Silly government, trying to get the most of our money all the time. Seeking to destroy trusts altogether, Wilson created the Clayton Antitrust Act as a backup to the Sherman Antitrust Act. Like a wingman, if you could call it that. Then to enforce the Clayton Act, Congress created the Federal Trade Commission to order firms to cease and desist. Not everyone saw Wilson's reforms in the same way, and unfortunately, even back then, bankers were smart enough to know how to bend the rules. Wilson solved this by a long heated debate in Congress resulting in the Federal Reserve System. This divided the country into 12 districts, each with a Federal Reserve Bank owned by its member banks. The member bank could draw from the Federal Reserve to meet short-term demands and therefore prevent bank failures. In 1916, it was election time again and the Bull Moose Party brought out Charles Hughes, which immediately proved hard to beat. Wilson barely defeated him, 277 electoral votes to 254. Although he did quite a lot, Wilson didn't address racial segregation and women's suffrage, mostly because his party platform had not endorsed it. Silly presidents, trying to stay in office and do good for the nation at the same time. But as World War I continued, America started to prepare for war and the calls for reform were drowned out. Except for one reform movement. Women's suffrage. It goes without saying that women are the backbone to human race survival, as are men, but they didn't have the same things that they have now and were often segregated for fear of becoming too masculine. Obviously, science still wasn't existent at the end of the Progressive Era. As reform movements grew, so did resistance, but Susan B. Anthony and Caddy Stanton weren't about to sit around and play housewife. No, they fought. And hard. 
In 1866, they founded the American Equal Rights Association. This was soon after split into the National Women's Suffrage Association and the American Women's Suffrage Association, which worked on winning voting rights on a state level. But this was only the start. Anthony was arrested for civil disobedience when her and a group of women insisted on voting at the polls in Rochester, New York. She was convicted and set free with a fine of $100, which she did not pay. Happily, though, she was still set free. The first suffrage amendment proposed to Congress in 1868 was stalled. Unwilling to give up, suffragists introduced a brand new amendment that used the wording of their very own Susan B. Anthony. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Receiving its first committee hearing in 1878, shortly after it was introduced, the amendment was yet again stalled, not being debated until 1887. It was then that it was passed in the Senate. Unfortunately, in 1896, the Anthony Amendment disappeared completely, not resurfacing until 1913, 17 years later. Susan B. Anthony, Caddy Stanton, and Lucy Stone, as well as some other young leaders, founded the National American Women's Suffrage Association in 1890. By this time, women had won many rights. For example, they could now buy, sell, and will property. Yet from the 1890s to 1910, the suffrage movement seemed to have failed. Suffragists took two paths to achieve their goals. One path was to battle the government for a constitutional amendment to let women vote, and the other path concentrated on individual states to pass a law. The U.S. entered World War I in April of 1917, creating a need for women in the workforce. The theoretical spheres designated to men and women were completely forgotten, and almost on cue, Congress passed the 18th Amendment, otherwise known as Prohibition, leaving liquor interests that opposed suffrage to no longer having a reason to. 1919 brought the passing of the suffrage amendment. The ratification battle ended in August of 1920 with Tennessee finally turning its tides for the 36th and final state necessary to ratify the amendment. The 19th amendment was the last major reform of the progressive era. Well folks, hope you learned something. And if nothing else, take two things away from this video. One, men can be inordinately stupid at times, and two, women never give up. Stay tuned for next time when we discuss the game-changing Roaring Twenties. Until then, laugh at my mistakes. Thanks for watching. I love the home of the free and the brave. Every heart beats through under red, white, and blue. The nation went into an outright frenzy, mostly because it was a jungle. Jake, why are you clicking? Son of a gun. Jake. Seriously. ...of the 20th century. Oh yes, nailed it! Boom. Beep, beep, beep. Municipal reforms, oh forget it. Conditions, all people would become the good citizens. And after the United Mine Workers called a protest to strike their, that wasn't right at all. Fantasy the light of our better Congressional committee, committee, what the heck? Not everyone saw it. Wow, that was a long pause again. This, I hate the desk. I've stepped on something. I may have just, I, 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 I biffed it. Started to America started to prepare. Was introduced. The bill was again stalled. Bill, it's not a bill.